This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1056, recorded on October 26, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. So what happened, Daniel? So I finally got COVID, Vincent. (laughs) You think you got it at ASTMH? I'm feeling pretty confident. (laughs) So So. this is interesting because how long before did you have the the new vaccine? So it was about 18 days before. So I was, you know, I I knew I was going to be engaged in this high-risk activity, um, and so I, I, I did all the things that I thought I should do. So, you know, I, I got my um, my booster um, about two weeks before. Actually, Dixon, Chuck, and I all went to separate locations. Um, that's just, you know, in case something happens to one of us, right? You know, you want one of us still alive. But <laughs> so uh, um, and then I went to the conference and, you know, and I, I made that decision um, that, you know, I was going to have the mask off. I was going to have lots of face-to-face time with all my uh, friends, colleagues throughout the world. And I knew it was a chance. Um, So I had some testing. So when I did get home, um, it was a Sunday morning, right? So, so Saturday night, right before I went to bed, I was like, you know, I feel a tiny bit of a scratchy throat, right? Mm. But you know, whatever, not a, and then Sunday morning, I'm getting up to go for a run. So obviously feeling horrible, right? And I'm like, you know, before I go for a run, I should probably uh, do a test. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, do the test and I'm getting ready to put my shoes on and I look over and at 15 minutes, there was a faint positive line. Mm. So I um, started on Paxlovid that morning, Sunday morning. Um, on Monday, there was a solid um, line. And actually, I felt crummy um, Sunday evening, Monday morning. Um, by about um, Monday afternoon, I was starting to feel a little bit better. By Tuesday morning, uh, nothing. Felt completely fine. I was already antigen negative by Wednesday morning. Hmm. Um, and I have to say, I never got a fever and everyone got a cough. My wife was a little bit annoyed with me. Like, why aren't you? Um, but, you know, I did, you know, I, I boosted. I got a treatment right away. And so far, so good. So uh, having the vaccine probably gave you a mild infection, but we won't know because you took Paxlovid, right? You know, that's the whole problem with not having like the ability to, uh, you know, split yourself and one of them yeah. takes Paxlovid, yeah. one doesn't see. But you no, know, it was great. I mean, basically about 24 hours after starting on Paxlovid, like just like that study we talked about, I basically was feeling fine. So, but I'm still taking the whole week off from work. So, uh, all right. By, Except for yeah. TWIV. You're not taking <laughs> TWIV off. Not taking TWIV off, but all right. So let's jump right into it. Um, In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And that's by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, people can figure out where that fits in as we go forward. But the MMWR, Vital Signs, Health Worker Perceived Working Conditions and Symptoms of Poor Mental Health Quality of Work Life Survey, United States 2018-2022, came out this week. Um, and this is data from the General Social Survey Quality of Work Life Module. Uh, it's a questionnaire with 25 items administered via personal interview, telephone interview, or web-based questionnaire. Uh, the response rate was actually over 50%, and they reported that the percentage who reported feeling Feeling burned out was very often with 19.0% and 44.2% of healthcare workers reported being somewhat likely or very likely to look for a new job in 2022. Hmm. So a little, uh, little disappointing. Um, so I'm, I'm still going to be here by the I'm not looking for another job, just by the way. Um, all right, MPOX, the article MPOX Neutralizing Antibodies at Six Months from MPOX Infection or MBABN Vaccination. A comparative analysis was published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. And here we read that people vaccinated with the Bavarian Nordic vaccine uh, were found to develop frequently low or median MPOX neutralizing antibodies when compared with infected individuals. One in 10 vaccinated individuals showed no detectable neutralizing antibodies at six months, whereas every person with MPOX infection developed antibodies. Hmm. So 
one more example of how the best way to get an infection is to not get an infection, is to get an infection, or perhaps why measuring antibodies might be like a blind man feeling the tail of an elephant. I mean, the, the vaccine does induce protection in, in some people. It's not great, but it does. So yep. I'm not sure what this means at all. <laughs> yeah. The, I'm, not pretty, <laughs> I'm not sure the sky's falling. I'm not sure the best way to protect yourself against an MPOX infection is to get an MPOX infection. I so. think you should still get vaccinated, don't you think, if you're in the risk population? <laughs> Yeah, not only that, but fortunately, it's being, um, as they say, commercialized. And so now this is going to be just a routine vaccine. It's not going to be having Good. to go to some center and the government deciding who who can and can't access the vaccine. Um, so, all right, leishmaniasis. What is that, Vincent? I see you yawning. <laughs> Nothing to do Vincent, with leishmaniasis. You've learned all about this parasite on Twip. <laughs> this is exciting. I know. This is that parasite that one acquires from the bite of a small, delicate sand fly. Well, a study was recently shared at the annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Meeting and Hygiene in Chicago. The researchers analyzed 1,222 um, samples sent to the CDC that tested positive for leash maniasis. Um, and, and I want to point out the majority of the samples sent to the CDC for leash maniasis testing came back positive, suggesting to me a bit of underdiagnosis. Um, 86 of the confirmed cases were from patients with no travel history outside of the United States. So these are these are folks living here in the U.S., mostly down in Texas, um, and they actually develop these non-healing crater form ulcers. Um, and actually, there's a there's a nice uh, there's a nice article um, by. Uh, See Brenda Goodman, uh, and she interviews uh, Gideon Wasserberg. And Dr. Wasserberg says he's glad to see the study because awareness of the disease in the U.S. is so low. Most doctors, if you ask them, is there a leash mania in the U.S., they say, no way, or what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I liked his quote. So uh, I'll leave a link in to, uh, to Brenda Goodman's article. Also, you can go to Parasites Without Borders. You can learn about leishmaniasis so that you're not one of those doctors who says, what is that? Daniel, if you ask most doctors, is there polio virus in the U.S., what would they say? Uh, of course not. That's been eradicated. <laughs> okay. Better than what's that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. At least at least a little bit better. Um, dengue. Are you ready for this? The public health department in Pasadena, California, reported a case of locally acquired dengue. This is the state's first case. And uh, the state recommends that you use insect repellents containing CDC or EPA approved active ingredients. And they list DEET, picaridin, IR3535, or oil of lemon eucalyptus. And I actually spent a little time going down the rabbit hole of does oil of lemon eucalyptus work? And apparently very high concentrations of oil of lemon eucalyptus are um, equivalent to very low levels of DEET. So got an alternative out there. Uh, vaccines and monoclonals, RSV. Uh, apparently we have a shortage of nirsevimab nurse of VMAB, I like to call it, Bay Fortis for the babies. Um, and this just reminded me of that question that we had um, on a previous episode. Uh, you know, mom was trying to decide, should I get the uh, the vaccine uh, during the last trimester of pregnancy or should um, I go ahead and the baby get the Bay Fortis? Well, limited availability of nurse VMAB in the United States states has prompted uh, the recommendation that providers should actually encourage pregnant people to receive the vaccine um, because there may not be enough monoclonals to go around for all the babies. So I'll leave in some links there for that, um, that emergency. Daniel, speaking of vaccines, on Saturday I got, or Sunday, I got flu, COVID, RSV all at once. I'm proud of you, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's why you did it. <laughs> Just to make, to me make proud. you proud. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, what is going on with COVID? Well, we we have our BNO weekly update. Uh, new cases still about about averaging over two hundred thousand um, in hospital, down a little to thirteen thousand five thirty three. The ICU one thousand five hundred sixteen. New deaths were still averaging over fifteen hundred. Still averaging over two hundred um, a day. And finally, you Italians, you got that wastewater stuff going in the right direction in the Northeast. So, Look at that. Uh, <laughs> going down. <laughs> finally. Um, no, no more Italian holidays. No more Columbus Day celebrations to have to worry about, hopefully for a while. 
Um, but no, we expect things to be a little better, um, except for me, of course. Um, and then um, we'll see what happens December and January. Um, all right, you know we've been we've been talking about this um, concept, which I really like the idea that mom can get a vaccine and then protect the baby. So um, we have the article "Newborn and Early Infant Outcomes Following Maternal COVID-19 Vaccination During Pregnancy," published in JAMA Pediatrics. And so these are the results of a population-based retrospective cohort study that took place in Ontario, Canada, um, using multiple linked health administrative databases. Um, singleton live birth with an expected delivery date between May 1, 2021 and September 2, 2022 were included. Um, they analyzed um, the data, 142,006 infants, um, about half of them were male were included, uh, 85,670. Uh, mom got vaccinated during the pregnancy, so about 60%, and the infants of the vaccinated mothers had lower risks of severe neonatal morbidity neonatal death, and ICU admission. Now, this is one that is, uh, you know, hitting close to home for me, Vincent, as I'm isolating for the infected. Mm -hmm. um, for an introvert like myself, there's certain advantages. So uh, I, I would like this to be long. But the article, Duration of SARS-CoV-2 Culturable Virus Shedding in Children, was recently published in JAMA Pediatrics. And here they look at a cohort of children aged 7 to 18 years who had a positive result via PCR for COVID-19 uh, that were recruited between April and September 2022. They obtained pharyngeal swabs during five home visits over 10 days with day zero designated as the date of a positive test result. Uh, samples were refrigerated, delivered within 24 hours of collection to a laboratory for variant assessment. The primary outcome was cytopathic effects, CPE, assessed by bright field microscopy and determination by inoculation of the sample in growth media. If CPE characteristics were observed in 30% or more of the six-day post-inoculation images, samples were considered CPE positive. Of the 76 participants, 68.4% uh, were vaccinated, 55% were right in the 7 to 12, um, pretty much split 50-50 male-female. Now, I will read what they say, but we'll translate. They observed a median duration of infectivity of three days um, with 14 participants, 18.4%, um, still, as they say, infectious on day five and 3.9% on day 10. So what they really mean to say is the median duration of being able to pick up a cytopathic effect from these procurements was um, three. So the median day of getting those CPE, we saw about 18.4% still on day five and only about 4% on day 10. A couple things, we'll keep translating that, but the median duration of positivity among vaccinated children was three days and among the unvaccinated children, three days. Hmm. It's very interesting, isn't it? Are really interesting. So they comment that the lack of association between vaccination status and infectivity was robust um, when they controlled for demographics. Among vaccinated children, duration of infectivity was similar for children who received a booster versus those who did not. I was a little annoyed. I'm thinking with my booster, you know, maybe that's why my antigen test was already negative after only, you know, a couple of days. They conclude by saying, our findings suggest that current policies requiring isolation for five days after a positive test might be appropriate as the majority of children were not infectious by day five. So Additionally, return to school policies may not need to discriminate by vaccine or booster status. So the, um, first of all, Day three in both vaccinated and unvaccinated, there could be a difference in titer. We're not looking at virus titer here. We're just looking at yeah. The that bothered me, right? right? That they didn't do it. That it wasn't quantitative. That it was just. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is typical yeah. that we don't do plaque assays because I think that would tell us a lot more. Um, so, I mean, then the other thing is, <laughs> if you are, so they're saying keep keep kids home, you know, for five days. I mean, how, how long are we going to do this? Do you think forever? or another year, because we don't do this for flu. We don't do it for RSV, for, for uh, coronavirus, common cold. So I, I understand now, you know, we're, we're close to the pandemic, but 
are we going to do this forever? We're going to say you have to stay home for five days after you get a positive? You know, it's interesting, right? Because we always talk about the science and now we're sort of wading into, you know, what should the public policy be yeah. based upon that? But yeah, so I mean, here's here's the science sort of, um, you know, we're basically saying that, you know, most most folks, it's only about three days that you can even culture virus. And and we've talked repeatedly about how sensitive is that, right? You know, if I, if I have my son Barnaby try to culture virus and he can't culture any and, you know. Well, he may not know what he's doing, and so we don't we don't know how sensitive the assay is here. Yeah. Um, is this really you know if you can't culture a virus, does that really mean you don't have to worry? And then again, if you can culture a virus, well, it's probably a threshold. It's probably not this binary. Um, but then becomes the the social policy: um, vaccination, boosters, ready access to um, antivirals. Um, yeah, the, those all become important policy questions um, because, yeah, you know, mo most people, they get the flu and they go right to the office and give that to everyone. They go, That's they get right. RSV, right? And they go right, right into work and give that to uh, yeah, folks. I mean, you're not going to change that, right? It, it may not be the right thing to do, but it's not going to change. And the question is just when SARS-CoV-2 joins that, not, you know, go to work mentality. And I wonder if it ever will. There's there's always this thing. I was talking to mm. my uh, communicating, texting on the phone uh, with my uh, partner, Nujali, this week um, about the fact that everything with COVID somehow is special, right? We always have this thing in, in yeah. infectious disease where when, as soon as we can switch to oral, that's great. We go ahead. Um, but there's always something about COVID, right? Where, oh, it's COVID. It's different. You got to call the pharmacist. They're going to restrict the Paxlovid that's you know fully licensed. And mm. um, yeah, so uh, it, it might be a little time, but we'll see. But let's jump right into what I think is a very exciting article, Vincent. Um, we are now in COVID early viral phase. You've tested positive. What is the number one recommended therapy? Paxlovid, Paxlovid. now fully licensed. And one day it'll be in special boxes. Mine was in an EUA box. But <laughs> <laughs> we have the article, Retrospective Cohort Study of Prescribing Outcomes in Outpatients Treated with Nermotrelvir Ritonavir for COVID-19 in an Interdisciplinary Community Clinic, recently published in PLOS One. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is the headlines seem to miss the point, right? The headlines are like, oh, everyone, when you give them Paxlovid, it's, it's really complicated. It's all kinds of trouble. Well. It's a nice article looking at how often a provider needs to make adjustments as they go through the medication list. These are results of a single-center retrospective cohort study of adult outpatients prescribed um, Paxlovid in a community COVID-19 clinic in Toronto, Ontario, between March 3rd and September 20th, 2022. Um, they go ahead and they perform a descriptive analysis of the patient population, uh, the need for renal adjustments. Uh, potential drug-drug interactions, the drug-drug interactions that occurred, treatment adherence, adverse drug um, outcomes. So ultimately, we've got 637 individuals who they want to prescribe Paxlovid to during the study period. Uh, the median age was 70. Uh, the median number of risk factors for severe for severe disease was two. Um, almost half, 45%, were immunocompromised, and 82% had received three or more COVID-19 vaccine doses. Um, first, we hear about compliance. 95% of them completed the five-day course of therapy, um, with 68% having complete symptom resolution by the end of follow-up at day 28. Um, overall, hospitalizations were low. Within 28 days, was 3.3% in this high-risk cohort. Um, and there were 1.2% was attributable to COVID-19. And all these 600 plus high risk individuals, there were zero deaths in the folks that ended up getting treated. Now, here's what gets into the headlines. Over 70% had one or more clinically significant drug-drug interactions that required mitigation. So let's let's go through it. What was was this insurmountable, right? I mean, this is great outcomes. You've got only 3% ending up in the hospital. Nobody's dying. Oh, it was only 1.2% were ending up because of COVID. Um, so about 28.7% of these older folks had decreased renal function. So you had to click the renal Paxlovid instead of the regular Paxlovid box. Um, when it came to drugs, we're talking mainly about cardiovascular drugs. That was 55%, so the majority of the time. And most of those were lipid modifying. Most folks were on statins, so about 30% on statins, 
very simple. Stop the statins for 10 days and uh, restart them when you're done. Um, next after that was calcium channel blockers, you know, maybe dropping the dose in half, depending upon how good the blood pressure control is to start. A um, few other things in there. You can't take your Viagra for five days. Oh, my. Um, some of the interesting things I want to say, and you can go through their chart of what they say, is that when you find something, for instance, a patient might be on diazepam. And you go, and I'm going to leave a link, the covid19-druginteractions.org forward slash checker. If you put in that you're going to try Paxlovid, Nermatrelvir, Ritonavir, and then you click that you might want to do diazepam, it will actually tell you diazepam is not recommended and will then actually give you a suggested substitution, lorazepam, which it says is fine. Um, if you're worried about Eliquis, it'll again give you direction on what to do. So when you actually do this properly, there was only 0.12%, only one person in the over 600 people who actually had a DDI severity of level one where it was contraindicated. So the headline should be very easy to overcome and manage these drug interactions and get the excellent outcomes that they reported here. All right. So this is a, you know, put this as a long COVID one, but it's right up front. I also want to share the article, Nermatrelvir and Malnupiravir and Post-COVID-19 Condition in Older Patients, recently published in JAMA Internal Medicine. So here the investigators looked at a cohort of Medicare enrollees age 65 and older diagnosed with COVID-19 between January and September 2022. Any new occurrence uh, not present prior to COVID-19 diagnosis of the 11 symptoms in the WHO consensus definition of post-COVID conditions between 4 to 12 weeks after infection were considered as post-COVID condition. So ultimately, huge sample, 3,975,690 outpatients with COVID-19 were included in the study. The post-COVID condition incidence among patients receiving Paxlovid was 11.8%, Malnupiravir 13.7%, and 14.5% for folks that did not get either of these antivirals. Um, so we end up with a uh, hazard ratio of 0.87, so about a 13% reduction in your risk of long COVID with Paxlovid, a little bit less with Malnupiravir. Um, and then we have the added reduced risk we get from our vaccines. All right. After the Paxlovid, number two, remdesivir, that's that three-day. Number three, malnupiravir. Number four, convalescent plasma in certain contexts. Um, and then avoid those harmful and useless things. But we do have other things on the horizon. And, and recently, I've been getting a lot of questions about the oral protease and citrelvir from uh, from Japan. So just just an update. What's what's going on there? Um, so you know, just like with uh, Paxlovid, with the Epic trials, we have a Scorpio HR, a Scorpio SR, a Scorpio PEC. So that's a high risk, um, a standard risk, and a post exposure prophylaxis. So for the high risk, there was actually a poster at ID Week suggesting a uh, reduction in long COVID if started in the first three days after symptom onset. Um, in the standard risk, um, we actually had some, some data um, suggesting that we had a quicker um, resolution of symptoms and um, folks tested negative about 36 hours faster than placebo. Um, so fever, congestion, sore throat, cough, impacts on taste, smell, and fatigue resolved about a day earlier. I'll leave a link to a preprint there. I'm still waiting to find out on the um, the post exposure prophylaxis, um, but so far we're we're waiting. And I think a big thing I've seen a lot of um, you know is the FDA slow rolling this or anything like that. Um, we have yet to see compelling data that rivals that of Paxlovid for a reduction in progression to severe disease in the high risk folks. So um, currently approved for e by EUA in Japan. Um, I, event I suspect we'll eventually see this on the shelves in the US. And I'll leave um, some links in to some news from, from Shionogi, the ID Week stuff, and also a nice article in The Atlantic by Rachel Gutman Y. 
All right. Isolation for the infected. I'm currently doing this, Vincent. So uh, just mm-hmm. to remind everyone, it's not just about taking your drugs and trying to get better, but uh, the reason we isolate is maybe not to spread it to others. So, um, you know, for a while, the healthcare providers, the, the healthcare professionals, HCPs, um, were in a separate category. And I was wondering if we'd ever get updated. That was updated finally in August 22, 2023. And I'll leave a link in there. Um, but isolation, they say, can be discontinued after five days after symptom onset. But remember the way we count. It's always different. Day zero is the day symptoms appeared. Um, Day one is the first full day thereafter. Fever has to be resolved for at least 24 hours without taking drugs to make that happen. Um, And then even after that, um, it's recommended you wear a high-quality mask um, around others, um, you know, folks who are at risk. And then they do mention, and this is also aligns pretty much with non-healthcare professionals, a test-based strategy for removing the mask sooner. Um, Here they talk about, and I'll leave links, if you have access to antigen tests, you should consider using them with two sequential negative tests 48 hours apart. You may remove your mask sooner than day 10. Um, and I'll also leave the link for the non-healthcare providers. What day are you at, uh, Daniel? Well, this is good. We can do the counting. So started to get a little bit of a raspy throat on uh, Saturday night. So That's Sunday was, so I don't get to count until day, you know, Sunday. So Sunday I test positive. Okay. Day one, day two, day three. Thursday is day four. Friday will be day five. Tomorrow, Okay. Did I count that right? No, no, I counted it wrong. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today is day five. All right. <laughs> so I will do my um, I will do my sequential negative test. I already had a negative test from yesterday. So forty eight hours tomorrow morning, um, I will check forty eight hours after the last one, and hopefully that will be negative. But I'll make sure to do a very aggressive procurement just to see. All right, and you're wearing a mask at home now, right, Daniel? You know, I am actually. I hold it up. It's one of these <laughs> proper goes around the back of my head, and yeah. So I'm I'm still isolating. Um, we eat outside, you know, quite distance from each other. But yeah, whenever I leave the isolation of my room where I'm not outdoors, I've got a proper tight fitting mask. And uh, when are you going back to work on Monday? So I will not go back to work until next week, and even then, I'll wear an N95. Okay. All right. Second week, right? So we'll we'll be checking in next week. You can see how I do, whether or not that cytokine storm descends upon me. Um, and if it does, number one, if those oxygen saturations get less than 94%, steroids. Um, anticoagulation, if you end up in the hospital, we have guidance there and we're updating. We have another publication in the works from ASH. Pulmonary support, remdesivir still in the first 10 days, maybe immune modulation with tocilizumab and avoid those unnecessary antibiotics and proven therapies. And yes, I got something for you here. Um, you know, Vincent, I didn't get enough uh, hate mail about the ivermectin um, from last week or, or or recommendations to take ivermectin when, uh, you know, I, I tweeted that I had the dreaded COVID. Um, yeah, it was entertaining. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the article, Intravenous Vitamin C for Patients Hospitalized with COVID-19, Two Harmonized Randomized Clinical Trials, the Lovid COVID Investigators on behalf of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, and the REM CAP Investigators published in JAMA. Um, in these harmonized, randomized prospective trials, patients were randomized to receive vitamin C administered intravenously or control, placebo or no vitamin C, every six hours for 96 hours. Um, I don't know if you know much of the history here, um, but there was a there was a paper put forth, which we now realize may have been fraudulent, um, suggesting a benefit to vitamin C. When it was repeated, they failed to show a benefit. But early on, a lot of folks were getting this high-dose vitamin, um, IV vitamin C in the ICU. Well, enrollment was terminated after statistical triggers for harm and futility were met. Mm -hmm. The trial had primary outcome data for 1,568 critically ill patients, um, 1,037 in the vitamin C group, 531 in the control group, um, 1,022 patients were not critically ill. In there, we had 456 in vitamin C, 566 in the control group. Among critically ill patients, the median number of organ support free days. So I want to clarify, this is when you're doing okay and you don't need to be supported by mechanical mm-hmm. ventilation, et cetera, was seven for the vitamin C and 10 for the control group. 
So you actually ended up doing worse and requiring more support if you're getting vitamin C, um, just at odds ratio of 0.88. So basically getting vitamin C had a trend toward increased number of days they needed organ support. Among critically ill patients, survival to hospital discharge was 61.9% for the vitamin C group versus 64.6% for the control group. Among patients who were not critically ill, survival to hospital discharge was 85.1 for the vitamin C, 86.6 for the control group. So neither of those were trending in the right direction. So they conclude in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, vitamin C had a low probability of improving the primary composite outcome of organ support-free days and hospital survival. Um, and I put the curves up there for you to look at. But um, I did want to actually share the comments from some of the investigators. Um, the results from this trial suggest that the use of vitamin C in hospitalized COVID-19 patients should be de-adopted. <laughs> Francis Lamonte, MD of the University de Sherbrooke and co-lead investigator of the trial said in a press release. The results underscore the health and ec economic benefits of identifying and abandoning readily available interventions that are ineffective and potentially harmful to patients. And in an editorial on the study, the author said the findings were concerning as they showed the possibility that vitamin C is detrimental in patients with COVID-19 because of the probability of harm exceeded 90% for organ support-free days in both critically ill patients and those who are not critically ill. So greater than 90% chance that you are harming your folks when you give them the IV vitamin C. Well, we hope that this message gets out there now, right? I really hope it does. I mean, it really, there was this idea that, oh, the vitamin C and why wasn't this happening and people were mm -hmm. clamoring and um, yeah, this is not good. This is, you know, I think we've, we've learned. We've learned that ivermectin is not helpful. We've learned that hydroxychloroquine probably increased mortality. Um, we have learned that vitamin C is probably detrimental and harmful. So we need to stop doing things that hurt our patients. All right. And we will finish up with COVID late phase, long COVID. Um, now, I think there's a good reason to use PASC, um, post-acute sequelae of COVID, um, because not everyone we see has a recognizable long COVID syndrome. So we have the article, Association Between Guillain-Barre Syndrome and COVID-19 Infection and Vaccination, a population-based nested case control study recently published in Neurology. So these are the results of a nested case control study in a cohort of 3,193,951 patients uh, 16 years of age or older without a prior diagnosis of GBS from the large, largest healthcare provider in Israel. Subjects were followed from January 1st, 2021 until June 30th, 2022 for the occurrence of GBS. Um, 10 randomly selected controls were matched to each case of GBS um, on age and sex. They assessed both SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 vaccination administration in the prior six weeks in cases and controlled. Um, this analysis showed that the odds ratio for GBS associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection was 6.3. And actually, COVID-19 vaccination reduced that by more than half. So basically getting one of those natural COVID-19 infections was associated with more than a six-fold higher risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome, ascending paralysis, and getting vaccinated dropped your risk in half. Now moving on to men and the urinary system and that darn prostate. The article SARS-CoV-2 infection correlates with male benign prosthetic hyperplasia deterioration recently published in the Journal of Inter Internal Medicine. So here, the authors looked at 17,986 individuals and find that when compared to controls, the people that got COVID-19 demonstrated statistically significant higher incidence of retention of urine, about 5.3 times more, hematuria, that's blood in the urine, 3.0 times more, clinical urinary tract infections, about three times higher, and people needing to start on those BPH medications 25 times higher need. Um, and it did not actually seem to matter how severe the bout of COVID-19 was. So, so like SARS-CoV-2, it's like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And, and it gets everywhere, Vincent. Unbelievable. 
<laughs> but but is it replicating everywhere? Well, yeah, last that's a good week, question. <laughs> <laughs> last week, a few of our issues, uh, a few of our listeners took issue with the fact that I dug up the study and discussed uh, the the brains of the beagles and. Um, you know, I have I have a couple a couple ideas about how we might um, address this issue. Like, is there really um, is there really replicating um, RNA in there in these in these reservoirs that people talk about? So, you know, one of the things people are doing is these prolonged courses of Paxlovid. So maybe if there's replicating virus driving things, that that might help. Um, but the other thing is maybe we could take these organs, Vincent, out of people with COVID. And then transplant them into people, aggressively immunocompromise them, mm. and then see if the virus grows out. Mm. Now, that may sound like mad science, but the editorial, Changing Paradigm, Transplanting Candidates with Coronavirus Disease 2019, was published in Transplant Infectious Disease. Um, and, you know, it isn't mad scientists because er in the early days, there was this challenge is can we safely transmit transplant those organs from people who died of COVID-19. And there are thousands of people who, who desperately are waiting for those organs. So as was shared at ID Week, thousands of people who had COVID-19 and, and did not survive had organs harvested, transplanted into other individuals. Um, and we really did not see replication of SARS-CoV-2 into those recipients of those organs. Um, the Changing um, Paradigm article actually discusses and shares some cases where this was done. Also in the same issue of Transplant Infectious Disease, we have the article, Favorable Experience of Transplant Strategy, Including Liver Grafts from COVID-19 Donors, One-Year Follow-Up Results. And these were the results on 280 patients who um, underwent liver transplant. Um, and basically, again, um, they report that the results of this transplant strategy, including liver grafts from COVID-19 donors, was favorable. Um, the only problem they actually had is an increased hepatic artery thrombosis. All right, and I'm going to wrap it up there. As I've been saying, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We're getting this. This is it. This is our last episode in October. This is the end of our floating doctors fundraiser for August, September, and October. Um, we are very close. I think we're going to make it. So uh, pause the recording right here. Go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. Click on that donate button um, and help us support what we do and contribute to our fundraiser. It's time for your questions. For Daniel, you can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Cynthia writes, Number one, is there any evidence that older adults with a solitary kidney can safely use Paxlovid? A 75-year-old family member required a nephrectomy a few years ago due to renal cancer. They are vaccinated and receive every booster available, but recently had COVID. Half dose of Paxlovid was offered, but ultimately not taken since symptoms were already improving. It made me wonder if this has been studied and somehow that and someone in this position should weigh the pros and cons with their physician. Yeah, so I, I think it's uh, I think it's cute that they got a half dose of Paxlovid. Now, <laughs> you don't get a half dose because you have one kidney, half the number of kidneys. You get a half dose if your GFR, your your kidney function, is below sixty. So. Some folks that donate a kidney, most folks that donate a kidney um, compensate and actually continue to have excellent kidney function. So when you're offering the Paxlovid to someone who only has one kidney, um, then you would base it on their glomerular filtration rate. So yeah, certainly plenty of folks with one kidney have gotten it. And if the person is at risk of progression, we would definitely recommend it. And number two, myocarditis was discussed in your most recent update. And as always, it's clear that this is much more common after an infection than after vaccination. As we weigh the risks of continuing to boost our teenage sons, I've been unable to find a study focusing on the risk of myocarditis from a breakthrough infection or after repeated boosters. Mostly what I see are the studies pointing to problems after dose two, greater with Moderna. What's the risk-benefit argument for this population to continue receiving boosters? Our teen boys each have had three Pfizer doses, one to two infections, have no health concerns that would put them in a high risk group. Curious what evidence may be out there regarding their risk of myocarditis from additional boosters versus additional infections. 
Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked this because this this is a nuanced discussion, right? And I and I was recently listening to the Paul Offit, um, you know, Beyond the Noise, and and where you know it is okay to have these discussions. It is it is appropriate to have these questions. Um, if COVID was gone, then we would no longer be boosting. Um, is it a super high priority for someone under the age of 65 without risk factors to get boosted? Not the same priority as someone over 65, over 70 with risk factors, et cetera. Um, when they talk about myocarditis, the risk pericarditis with infection versus boosters, it's not just about that. If you talk about just about that, certainly the incidence is higher if you get infected without the protection of a vaccine. So if you're basically saying, COVID's here. My son's probably going to get infected at some point. Um, do I want them to be protected when they get that infection? The binary is really between getting infected without the protection of a vaccine versus getting infected with the protection of a vaccine. And as we've talked about repeatedly, the, the protection of the vaccine goes beyond just the protection of the heart. Uh, we seem to see reduced risks of long COVID, other things. But we are moving into unknown territory as we keep boosting and boosting and boosting. Um, so, you know, these these will be areas where we get more and more information. Um, and there really is a gradation between the recommendations for the vaccination across the board. Sure, we recommend everyone get vaccinated, um, but the recommendation is stronger. The older you are, the more risk factors you have. Karen writes, I'm a 54-year-old woman who has never had chicken pox. Because of this, when my daughter's were young, our pediatrician gave me the chickenpox vaccine when they were vaccinated. Do you recommend someone in my situation getting the shingles vaccine? Could I possibly get another chickenpox vaccine to get a boost instead? Yes. Yeah, so the the Shingrix vaccine is better than the chickenpox vaccine, right? The chickenpox vaccine is actually an attenuated um, mm. viral replicating um, vaccine. The Shingrix is a protein-based um, vaccine, which actually we do think gives more robust and better protection. So given the choice, I would actually recommend go ahead with the Shingrix two shots. Charmaine writes, it, my understanding is that scientists are currently working on a nasal COVID vaccine that would elicit mucosal immunity at the point of entry for the virus thereby protecting against infection. Correct me if that's not quite right. <laughs> Vincent, I feel like I want you to jump in on this. No, no I'm not going to protect against infection. <laughs> that, is, that, is quite, that is quite the, um, yeah, it's, it's quite the bar, right? There is this idea that if, you're, if your nose, if your mucosal is just teeming with um, neutralizing IgA, that maybe to some degree you're going to reduce the risk yeah. of of infection progressing of you getting disease. Um, but the whole idea that it's going to be instantaneously sterilizing and there'll be no infection at all that that's that's a pretty high. Um, you know, I was reading about trypanosomes, where trypanosomes get the the human body to just keep producing antibodies and they switch and antibodies till finally like the human being just dies of exhaustion, right? Uh, so yeah. All the glucose and energy. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe this will be the next weight loss. We'll keep squirting things up people's noses every month or two, and the just the massive protein reduction will ultimately result in weight loss. Well, Charmaine wants to know. You know, people who exercise breathe through their mouth. So, could if you if you have a nasal vaccine, <laughs> would you get infected through your mouth then? See, that's the problem. I guess stop going to the gym. I might breathe through my mouth, and and all you know this this nasal IgA that I just developed is not going to be helpful. But no, I mean, people talk about this. There's billions of dollars going in this direction, but it, it's it's a whole new um, area, this whole idea that we're going to produce such a robust and sustained immune response that we're going to protect against even infection. Daniel, my understanding is that the, the infection is initiated in the upper tract, the nasopharynx. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're breathing through your mouth, it's still initiating in the nasopharynx. It's not initiating in your lungs. So... I don't think mouth breathers should worry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And finally, Sher Shirley writes, you you cap your weekly COVID roundup with recommended therapeutics. So I'm hoping you'll also address side effects of Paxlovid. I myself haven't gotten COVID, but I have many friends who've recently come down with it. Their doctors don't make recommendations, but when asked for COVID Paxlovid, they tell their patients that it's the patient's choice since they aren't too ill with COVID symptoms. 
From listening to your podcast, I urge these friends all over 70 to choose Paxlovid. But after starting, they stop due to side effects of diarrhea, gastro distress, and in one case, even white stools. Yikes. My questions, how common is this? Should they stop Paxlovid completely in this situation or switch to the lower dose? Should they continue and take Imodium? Should they switch to a different therapeutic? Your thoughts and what do you recommend to your patients experiencing side effects? Yeah, so the the most common is this, um, they call it dysgeusia, right? This impact that it has on your taste. Um, some people describe it as a metallic taste. Some people call it metal mouth. Um, the most recent description was soapy grapefruit. Um, okay, yeah, I'm on Paxlovid at the moment. Maybe it's a little bit of a soapy grapefruit. Um, some people do have loose stools, but again, a challenge is a lot of loose stools can actually be a presentation of COVID. So is that loose stools meaning that disease is progressing, uh, thus for you know the uninitiated, more evidence that you really need the Paxlovid to take? Um, no, I think the the metric needs to be the equation right up front is what are the potential benefits? What are the risks without treatment? Um, you know, if the person is 23 and taking it, okay. Um, but if the person is older, has a number of risk factors. We've talked about Paxlovid can reduce your risk of progressing, reduce your risk of ending up in the ER or a hospital, which is the last thing you want to do when you have COVID. Um, prevent you from not surviving, um, and also growing evidence that it can prevent you from having those long post-acute sequelae of COVID issues. So um, in general, we, we do recommend it, and 95% um, plus of people take Paxlovid with, with minimal um, side effects other than, at most, a bad taste in the mouth. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. 